So in 2025, we have the option to treat indefinitely with BTK inhibition or uh, give time-defined treatment with venetoclax and obinutuzumab. Around the corner here shortly, we will have formal approval of BTK plus BCL2 inhibitors plus minus anti-CD20 therapy with acalvin uh, with or without obinutuzumab based on the Amplify trial. What we don't know is what the best approach is at this point for a lot of patients. We have some idea for maybe the high-risk patients with chromosome 17p deletion that indefinite BTK seems to get the longest PFS. But for most patients, we don't necessarily know what approach is actually the best. And, and we do have some trials, thankfully, that are going to be investigating this. I think one of the promising elements of time-defined treatment when we give BTK plus BCL2 together in a time-defined way as opposed to indefinite BTK is, is there's data that shows when these patients do ultimately progress while on treatment holiday, they are not having BTK-resistant mutations appear and they respond to retreatment. So one of the ways to combat uh, resistant mutations seems to be to prevent them from occurring in the first place by doing time-defined treatment. For later lines of therapy, though, you know, for those patients that ultimately do progress on BTK inhibitors and have resistant mutations, we, of course, have uh, an FDA-approved non-covalent BTK inhibitor, pertabrutinib, but uh, we are seeing patients that have resistant mutations that lead them to either be refractory to pertabrutinib or they ultimately progress on pertabrutinib with new BTK mutations. And for those patients, we do need uh, other ways to go after uh, BTK. And uh, we do have BTK degraders that have uh, reported some data already that are promising and patients have responses that have progressed on both covalent and non-covalent BTK. We talked about uh, gen, you know, the, the genes of the cancer and prognostically that chromosome 17 aberration as, as being one that can help guide us, maybe steer us a little more towards indefinite therapy. But at this point, we, um, we think that most patients are eligible for, for the available options that we have with targeted treatment be it BTK or BCL2-directed therapy or the combination of, of both, which we should have available soon. And so it's going to be patient preference that ends up driving a lot of, of how we ultimately choose. Um, I think one of the interesting elements of the Amplify study that was just presented at ASH that looked at a calibrutinib and venetoclax for a year for first-line treatment with or without obinutuzumab is at the IGHV unmutated patients uh, seem to really benefit from the addition of obinutuzumab. So maybe that's another group uh, where we can use the prognostic workup to help guide uh, our, our therapy. But um, we, we try to take things into account like medical comorbidities, you know, cardiovascular comorbidities make us a little bit more worried about BTK inhibition, um, other uh, antiplatelet uh, medications that the patients are on make us worry about bleeding risks with co-administration with BTKs. You know, renal dysfunction makes us a little uh, nervous about uh, venetoclax and the, and the tumor lysis risk and, and relying on, on our clearance of, of the, um, you know, the, the, the tumor byproducts and, and, and being able to avoid TLS. So the renal dysfunction is one way that, that might steer us back the other direction towards BTK. So um, sometimes we have things that help guide us, but I find more often than not in the clinic, it's presenting the options to the patient and listening to what the patient tells me in terms of, of what their preference is. I think the biggest change to the standard of care um, is going to be BTK plus BCL2 inhibition 
uh, available in the frontline setting. And, and I mentioned ACAL and Venetoclax should be FDA approved just around the corner. It's already made it into to guidelines. I think patients are enthusiastic about oral only time to find therapies. Um, coming after that likely will be xanabrutinib plus sinrotoclax as a time to find combination. Uh, and then advances made for the double refractory patient population, I think are going to be key advances for those uh, few patients that get past our, our great first and second line options and need something beyond that. We've talked about BTK degraders, uh, which should um, become available in a, within a few years. We already have CAR T cell therapy, um, learning to better uh, utilize the CAR T cell therapy we have with Brianzi is I think a key way that we can help more patients. And it looks like possibly co-administrating a brutinib during the uh, apheresis process and, and after cell infusion seems to, um, seems to give better outcomes. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a key presentation I felt like from last ASH for those really difficult to treat patients and maybe more accessible ways to engage T cells in immune therapy um, to treat CLL. We've got the EPCOR CLL trial that was updated at ASH and shows impressive remission rates and overall response rates for using Epcortimab to treat very refractory CLL patients.